Good evening and welcome. Uh, I'm Ron Perrin, Professor Emeritus of Philosophy and Political Theory at the University, and have the uh, honor of introducing the speaker for tonight's 18th annual Bugby Memorial Lecture. This is an occasion that is made possible through the support of the Presidential Lecture Series. And once again, we want to thank George Dennison for his support of that series, and Jane Dennison for her gracious hosting of the speaker's dinner. I also want to acknowledge the presence of Sally Bugby, Henry's widow, and Bruce Bugby, Henry's son, who are here with us this evening. They've been here before and hopefully we'll all be here uh, down the road in future lectures. Henry Bugby was both the architect and the builder of the philosophy department at the University of Montana. That is to say, he gave it its shape and he gave it its substance. All of us who knew and worked with him knew that he represented a man for whom philosophy was more than a discipline, although a discipline it was, with its unique standards and requirements. He was a man for whom philosophy was a way of life, a life of reflection on the often ignored chores and pleasures of daily life, or as he put it, the rhythm of daily life. He carefully and responsively attended to that rhythm. Its deeper meanings and lasting significance could be brought to light and made visible for others to ponder and appreciate. This for Professor Bugby was the measure of the philosophical life. Everything I have said about the character of Henry Bugby applies equally to Albert Borgman, our Regents Professor of Philosophy. In his six books, and at the last reckoning, 84 essays, articles, numerous reviews, and constant lectures, he has explored the implications of the modern technological age for our politics, for our relationship to the environment and our relationships with one another. He wants to understand how the gadgets, devices, and operations that come with the apparently incessive and incessant development of technology have shaped our culture and impacted our lives. Above all, our domestic life. With all of this, Albert has maintained a steadfast commitment to identifying and articulating just what a life well lived, the good life, as he repeatedly puts it, just what such a life consists of. He is, in the best sense of the term, a moral philosopher. And fortunately for him and for us, he has been increasingly recognized as such. He has continually sought out to participate in conferences, both here and abroad, that address some of the most pressing issues of our time. Issues such as the ethical implications of the revolution in the science and practice of medicine. Such as what might be the human consequences 
of the massive accumulation and dissemination of information and of the postmodern global economy. Professor Borgman has been preceded in this lecture series by some of the most important philosophers of our time. Stanley Cavell, Alistair McIntyre, Herbert Dreyfus, W.V. O'Quine, and Robert Bella, to name just a few. I've never subscribed to the notion that familiarity breeds contempt. But in the academic world on any given campus, it can foster indifference to the most singular and exceptional individuals among us. If that has been the case with Professor Borgman, this evening represents a clear acknowledgement that he belongs with that distinguished company of Bugby lecturers. I expect that his topic this evening, Politics and the Pursuit of Excellence, continues a series of reflections he developed in his most recent book, Real American Ethics. The subtitle of that book and the opening sentence of its preface says as much about what he stands for and who he is as I can convey with these brief remarks. The subtitle is Taking Responsibility for Our Country. While the preface reads, this book is an attempt to come to terms with the country I love. As one for whom familiarity with Albert has brought not indifference, but warmth and respect, I am honored by this opportunity to introduce him to you. Thank you, Ron. That was special. Uh, Ron and I go back a long time, and we've worried together about politics in this country. So thanks. That was very gracious. And now let me add praise to what Ron already has said about uh, Henry Bugby. I still have a note from Henry that reads, Merry Christmas, Al. May trout and steelhead heat your flies in 73, Henry. <laughs> if it's possible to see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wildflower, it must be possible to see Henry in a note. So what do we see? First of all, we see friendship. Henry set a standard of friendship when he was chair and after that, that none of us have been uh, able to uh, equal. So before Christmas time, Henry would show up at your house with a bottle of wine, a note, and if you are lucky, a dry fly. So friendship, that was one of his great virtues. And speaking of dry flies, Henry was a wonderful fisherman who uh, was intrepid in wading into cold and raging rivers, going after the trout and the steelhead. And if you could see the writing of that note, you would also see the grace of Henry, which he displayed in his writing, as well as in the way in which he was able to cast a fly. He was a legendary fisherman. So there is, with, there is uh, friendship, there is courage, there is grace. And then, of course, there was wisdom. Henry wrote a book, I think, that can stand next to all the great books that have been written in the last 50 years. It's titled The Inward Morning. And uh, it's an underground classic. It's a, sort of like an aquifer that has fertilized and supported many, many plants, 
And every once in a while, like a spring crick, it comes to the surface and gets back into print. And uh, it must have gone in and out of print three or four times. It's in print again. You can get a copy in the lobby. The book was crucial to my own development and I'm greatly indebted to it. If it hadn't been for Henry, what I would have presented to you this evening would have been a sophisticated structural analysis of the technological society. The most I could have hoped for is that you were impressed by the sophistication, <laughs> but I don't think you would have taken much away from the lecture. And that's what I did early in the 70s at a conference in Bozeman. And Henry pointed out to me that that's not enough, that there is more to life and to philosophy than sophisticated structural analysis. And uh, so what I've learned from Henry is to affirm in my thinking what matters to me in life. So in that spirit, and looking to Henry as a model, I will talk this evening about uh, politics and the pursuit of excellence. My main thesis is uh, straightforward. It is that the pursuit of excellence needs the support of politics, and politics needs the invig invigoration of excellence. And my subsidiary point, which is more difficult, if not sophisticated, heavens forfend, is that in this interconnection of politics and excellence, we cannot be innocent bystanders, that we're implicated in how that issue gets worked out, and uh, that it is up to us as citizens at what level politics and excellence are joined. I will begin by talking about what seems to be the greatest obstacle to the political and public support of excellence, and that is the notion of, of autonomy. And I will then turn to the intersection of community and capitalism to show that what we think of as autonomy is far from being a straightforward and easily defended position. I will then uh, continue to point out that we have to take responsibility for our implication in uh, the development of uh, community versus capitalism. And I will, that'll be my fourth point, point out that only politics is the way in which we can discharge that responsibility. To do so, this is fifth, we have to have standards of excellence that we can all agree upon so that we can act constructively and politically. I will then, uh, in my sixth point, uh, gesture at some of the reforms that are called for. And uh, I will conclude with a theme that I announced at the beginning, showing how excellence and politics uh, need one another. So I'll talk for 40 minutes or so, and then I'll be glad to have your uh, comments and questions. So my first point then is uh, that the great obstacle to uh, supporting uh, excellence in the public sphere seems to be autonomy. No one opposes in the abstract the pursuit of excellence, though mediocrity has its defenders. Uh, Senator Roman Ruska in 1970 said that mediocrity was entitled to a little representation on the Supreme Court. But autonomy is by far the more, the more formidable rival of the public and political support of excellence. And most people think that autonomy should prevail. In fact, the two major political theories of the day, starting from very different positions, converge on just that point. 
uh, one of these theories is we may call the theory of uh, rights and liberties. The great historical proponent is Immanuel Kant, and in our day it was uh, the great John Rawls who defended that position. The rival position is uh, the uh, theory of pleasure and prosperity, historically represented by John Stuart Mill, and in our day by a person like judge and professor and writer Richard Posner. There is a minority school that champions perfectionism, and uh, that is to say the public requirement of supporting excellence. And historically, it's Aristotle who represents that school. And uh, not surprisingly, since it is a minority school, the present day defenders are less well known. George Schur is, is uh, an important one, and Thomas Herka, another. What are the arguments of these three schools? Not surprisingly, the rights and liberties theorists say that the pursuit of excellence by political means is inevitably biased and therefore inevitably disadvantages some people and therefore violates their rights and liberties. The school of pleasure and prosperity holds that the individual is the best judge of his or her happiness, and that we should therefore not interfere with people's choices in what they think makes them happy. And if we don't, then we can hope to have a maximum of pleasure, prosperity, and happiness. The perfectionists point out that contrary to these two schools that we can call the neutralists, because the idea is we should be neutral as regards conceptions of excellence, the perfectionists point out that contrary to what the neutralists say, the state always and already promotes some standards of in manners and morals of, of excellence. The second point that they make is that there are un, in, uncontroversial standards of, of excellence, and so there's no reason to be bashful about supporting them. And finally, they do, of course, support people's uh, rights and liberties, but they hold that they are best secured not by the neutrality of the state, but by guaranteeing these rights and liberties in the public sphere. Nonetheless, you can see that neutralism is arrayed with the colors of plausibility, diversity, pluralism, and tolerance. It seems just obvious that people should be free in what they like to think, what they like to say, what they like to move, whom they like to associate with, what they like to eat, what kinds of music they want to listen to, and how they want to spend their leisure time. The important point is that in this list of plausibility, an important divide is crossed. And it's the divide between rights and liberties that in fact have to remain unrestricted. And that, that's the civil liberties that are uh, spelled out and secured in the Bill of Rights. But then when you move over into you know, what we eat, what music we listen to, how we spend our le leisure time, you move into an area that's shaped by economic decisions and they're never neutral. They're always skewed in a certain way. They're conducive to a certain kind of behavior and it's in making those arrangements that we are implicated in what level of excellence is generally obtained. One way of spelling out what's involved here is to trace a development from community to capitalism. And uh, think of this valley here. It was first, of course, settled by the Native American tribes and they, of course, lived in communities, in bands, bands gathered in tribes, tribes 
gathered in nations. And of course, they were displaced from this valley by the Euro European settlers. But when they first came, they too lived in communities, in village communities. And by community, I mean a style of life where life is bound up with the land, with people, and with the seasons, and inevitably so. So the people who first came here had to pay close attention to the land, and in struggling to eke out a living here, they were dependent on one another. They could not avoid one another. And of course, they were very attentive to the seasons, to the rhythm of the seasons. And all this was changed by capitalism. And just as a note of caution, I think capitalism is just fine as long as it is properly regulated. So I'm just using capitalism as a way of looking at a very fundamental development. Capitalism has, as an explanatory device, has virtues and, and shortcomings. The virtue is that it pulls together a lot of things and pulls them together into a very powerful movement, namely the energy of the merchants, the ingenuity of inventors, and at length, the insight of scientists. And here too, we think of capitalism in a way that is plausible but also superficial. We think of capitalism as strengthening the market system, and in the market system, more goods are available, that raises prosperity, nothing could be more obvious. What we overlook is the fundamental changes on the ground that are necessary to expand the market system. If your connection to the next village is a rutted mule trail, then the market for wheat is your village. And it requires passable roads for a wheat market to develop that goes beyond your village. And when you think of it that way, it's obvious that the development of steam and steel and railroads was the most important transformation of the community system. And as you know, the, the railroad arrived here in the Missoula Valley in uh, 1883. And from then on, there was a shift that weakened community with its characteristic involvement and connection of people, the land, and the, and the seasons towards a system where all these bonds were first attenuated and then, to a large extent, disappeared. And at least within my lifetime here in Missoula and, and, and the older people among you and know how that development was gradual but also inexorable. So a new stage was reached when the interstate was finally completed, still another stage when uh, air travel became more convenient, but then also in inconspicuous ways uh, when a uh, trip to, say, Seattle became much more convenient with air conditioning or all-wheel drive, but also less memorable. And then more recently, developments such as uh, the rise of North Reserve Street and all the, the box stores that have accompanied it. And so when you look at the development, you can see how contact of people uh, became slowly thinner and, and finally dispensable, and uh, how your connection with the land and the seasons became attenuated. In the olden days, there was just one store where you could get your provender, and people knew you. They knew what you bought, they knew what you looked like, they knew when you were sick, they knew when your wife left you, but today, who cares? Nobody knows. And uh, 
the corner stores are gone, the uh, movie theaters are gone, and there is, of course, an increase in liberty and prosperity. You might think that, you know, not being sort of subject to inspection of the people at the store is a fine thing. Good riddance, you might say. And of course, the prosperity has increased tremendously, the, the stuff that you can buy. But what's the overall effect that this development had on the moral character of the population, and I mean moral in, the, in that broad human sense that includes both ethics and culture. Now before I talk about that issue, you have to know, and, and you know firsthand, that social reality is still complex, that people are decent, that they're hardworking, that there's a lot of variety, and so it may seem presumptuous to want to take the measure of the excellence of the culture at large. However, if there are social facts that can be established and that are troubling, it would be irresponsible not to acknowledge those facts and then to want to act on them. So are there overall facts about the physical and mental well-being of the population at large. Yes, there are such, such facts, and uh, they're troubling. And we all know them. The facts are that uh, two-thirds of us are overweight, one-third is obese. The uh, major diseases that we struggle with, cancer and heart disease, are largely due, are largely self-inflicted due to the fact that we eat too much and exercise too little. The intellectual well-being doesn't look much better either. There is just an enormous ignorance of the world across the population. Uh, fewer than half of the people can name both of their senators can explain what the Bill of Rights is. Uh, a quarter of the people only are able to locate on an unmarked map places such as Japan. There is enormous ignorance of how the world is put together. Uh, fewer than half of the people can tell you what the DNA is. Less than a quarter can tell you what a molecule is. So there are troubling facts out there. And uh, so we have to take responsibility for them. So what is it to take responsibility for them? In one way, people understand what's going on quite well. They understand the basic structure of the capitalist system. They know that they put in a decent job. They expect everyone to do the same thing. And they are confident that if everyone does that, there will be, and there's by now a record of 100 years, an increasing sense of security and prosperity. It's punctuated, of course, terribly by wars. It's punctuated by economic crises. And the way that this crisis has arisen and, and, and the way that we react to it sheds important light on what responsibility we're willing to take on and what kind of responsibility we try to suppress. Everyone now recognizes that something went wrong with the machinery of capitalism. But it's not as though we say, oh, well, yeah, you know, things happen. And uh, occasionally there is a problem. Everyone is upset about it. Everyone says, yes, we have to fix it. And that part we're glad to uh, take responsibility for. 
but we're not willing to look at the fruits of the machinery, what it delivers. And uh, it seems that, you know, you might say, well, why should we? You know, some people make the wrong use of technology and of the goods of capitalism. That's the price of freedom. But the problem is that most people don't decide. Most people just go with the flow of the system that we have established. They go with the prompts that we are given by the economic system. And that's the issue that needs to be raised. To highlight once more, the, uh, the way in which capitalism as an economic system has influenced the character of our lives. Remember that the heart is desirous and the mind is curious. And the heart has always been desirous. It's always desired warmth, food, shelter, and sex. And what happened in a community setting is that in the community setting, limits and disciplining forces were built into the system. And uh, these limits have fallen away, these disciplining forces are gone, and so we just overdo it in enjoying the benefits of the capitalist system. The mind is curious, and the mind has always been curious, Curiosity was a condition of survival. You had to have an interest in what was going on out in the world and to react to it in the, in the proper way. You had to be, the Native Americans had to be curious about when the berries were ripening, where the buffalo were moving, and uh, how the weather was changing. And the same, of course, was true of the homesteaders who came here first. But what are you supposed to be curious about in, as regards the capitalist system? Apart from that little access that you have to the machinery where you do your job, it's totally opaque. You can't hope to understand how the computer works or the television works that you spend a lot of time in front of. You can't hope to uh, understand how an airplane is engineered. You don't have any idea where the potato chips are coming from that you're eating. What you do know is that the uh, FDA and the FFA are looking out for you. And uh, you may not know what the initials stand for. <laughs> you may not even know that there are such agencies, but you're not wrong in thinking that it's a system that by and large works, and right now, you know, we've hit a lot of bumps, but we'll get over them. So how do you satisfy curiosity? Well, you get it in these little snippets that have the kind of ease and glamour of the foods and the entertainment that you consume. And so these basic forces that once worked so well with a pre-technological environment now have sort of been released from those circumstances and uh, have led to a condition that is deplorable. So that's the condition we have to take responsibility for. And the only way to do so is politics. Politics has declined as much as excellence has declined. Everyone agrees that the capitalist machinery is in ill repair and we just have to join forces to get it back on track and to get it moving again. And you leave politics out of it. Everyone agrees decisive action is needed, but 
you know, no bickering posturing, please. And yeah, right, action is needed, I agree. We shouldn't have a lot of bickering and posturing. But the sad thing is that this is what politics has come to mean, bickering and posturing. And the problem is that there is no other term or tradition that allows us to take on our responsibility other than politics. And so we need to recover politics as much as the pursuit of excellence. When it comes to uh, politics, you have to distinguish between the, uh, the form and the content. And the forms of politics, we should be grateful to note, are in fair shape. People have access to knowledge. Our elections are regular, free, and fair. People are able to express their, their general will in elections. And as it turns out, people are at times willing to uh, enact significant changes. But the changes are rarely more than capitalist machinery maintenance. That's what it's come to. And that's how you can rally people and how our people rallied today and again. I'm not against that endeavor. Uh, you know, you might say, first we gotta get the engine going again. Only then can we hope to steer the car in a better direction. Nonetheless, if that's all there is to politics, then it's clearly impoverished, and we should not be surprised that people are not engaged by it. So what we need to do is not just work on all the subjects that come under the heading of capitalist maintenance, but we have to put capitalist maintenance itself on the agenda and uh, take responsibility for what it is doing to the quality of our lives. To do so, of course, we need to have standards of excellence by which we can judge what's happening and that we can use as guideposts for reform. That then brings me to uh, the standards of excellence. And one of the supporting arguments of both the uh, rights and liberties people and the pleasure and prosperity people in support of neutralism is that standards of excellence are controversial and uh, if ever used as guides for political action, they will be partisan, ideological, and create nothing but mischief. And so the question is whether there is a way of looking at standards of excellence that would reveal a degree of unanimity and consensus. And, as I, and, and the problem is, as, I, as I've said this afternoon, is that when the question of standards of excellence is raised, most of us take on a defensive position because we know that the standards of excellence have a claim on us and for the most part we have been unequal to that claim. And the maneuver that we then employ is not to say, oh, I'm, I'm gonna change my life. Rather we say, hey, that's not up for debate. You know, if, if you want to be, you know, pursue perfection, go ahead, but not on my time and not with my support. So it's not as though we're opposing standards of excellence. It's that they make us feel uneasy, and so we try to get out from under them by rising to a point of order, right? I have nothing against standards of excellence, but hey, they don't belong on the political agenda. So the challenge then is to think of a position that you can invite people to take where looking at standards 
at the standards of excellence, they let go of their defensiveness and assume a benevolent and selfless attitude. And so most people will, when you invite them, to look at the situation from the parent's point of view, looking at a child, a four-year-old girl, and you ask yourself, what sort of person would you like her to be? And the answer, I think, important answers are just not controversial. The first thing is, we want her to be at home in the world. And that means we want her to be knowledgeable. Ignorance reduces people to gut reactions of zealotry, hostility, and prejudice. We want her to know what the world is like. So we want her to know what this world is made of. What, what are the ultimate constituents of the world? How did they come into being? How did they arrange themselves to give us the world that we know? What does the planet look like that we live on? How did life develop on that planet? What are the major cultures of the human family? What's the history of the country of which we're citizens? Whether you like it or not, whether she's going to like it or not, we want her to know what it is. And finally, we want her to know those moral standards that have a claim on every one of us. Next, we would want her to be vigorous, self-confident, at ease with her body, athletic, strong. Third, we want, we want her to be capable of deep and abiding friendships. And above all, we wish that she will be capable of forming that bond that we call marriage. And it's a bond that should be given respectfully to any two people casting their lot together, be they heterosexual or homosexual. And uh, finally, we would want her to be steeped and skilled in the arts, in the letters, in, uh, and in what we call the sacred. And I think there, too, there is an agreement that there are things out there that are sacred. And they can be spelled out in different ways by different people. They can be spelled out in religious terms. They can be spelled out as an ideal of humanity. They can be spelled out in the um, respect for nature. So these are the things that I think are just not controversial. Those are the things that we want our children to have, much as we may have failed in living up to those standards, or perhaps much as society may have, may have withheld from us the conditions that would have made it possible for us to pursue these standards. So these standards, I think, are the property of the human family. Almost all cultures value them. And in our culture, they're, that goes back to ancient Greece. They're called the, the virtues of wisdom of uh, courage, of friendship. The third one doesn't have a good term. It used to be, you know, indigenous spirituality. It was faith in Christianity. Uh, and I'll, I'll call it grace. And uh, that, uh, so what seems sort of obvious and uncontroversial when you take on, take on the uh, benevolent and selfless position of the parent is supported by the experience of the human family over thousands of years. It's also supported by the social sciences because the devotion to these kinds of virtues will give you the kind of enduring happiness that we wish for ourselves and, and for our beloved on calm reflection. 
Next, then, the question is, how do we advance the fate of the pursuit of excellence by political means? So let me take them in turn. How do we promote wisdom? Well, what is wisdom? Wisdom is the knowledge of how the world hangs together in its more, most important aspects. It's the discernment what ultimately matters in life, and it's a source of consolation. And wisdom, in that sense, may not be possible today. And, uh, but, as Aristotle reminds us, the next best thing is available. Wisdom, he says, depends on knowledge. So we certainly can be concerned about knowledge. And uh, it's the knowledge that I have uh, sketched in, in, in giving you know, the, the aspirations and the prospects of, of a daughter. So how do we promote that kind of knowledge? In uh, the Anglo-American countries, there has been a tradition of promoting them, and that used to be called a liberal arts education. And in uh, 1945, a group of eminent Harvard scholars issued a landmark in liberal arts education titled General Education for a Free Society. And that it's called the Red Book, because that's how it was bound, was remarkable in two ways. For one, of course, it was a response to the devastations and threats of fascism and communism, and, at, and an attempt at finding a solid bearing in light of these forces. But then also, it was very explicitly and emphatically a response to the looseness, the la di danas, the who cares character of liberal education at Harvard. And the result was the rock-ribbed curriculum of Harvard. What's been the fate of it? It's been eroded, disfigured, and it's all but useless as far as I'm concerned. And what happened? Ironically, the pattern that we've learned from capitalism has been imposed on general education. And what is that pattern? The pattern is, you know, worrying about the machinery. That's an important thing, means, right? And ends, well, who cares? Right, so we're all concerned about digitizing the electromagnetic spectrum. We're all concerned about, you know, giving access to everyone uh, to the internet. We're concerned about, you know, having internet too with higher bandwidth. What happens? That's none of our business. And how did that transfer to general education? The idea was don't teach students content teach them procedure, don't teach them history, teach them how to think like a historian. So it's the triumph of procedure over content, of skill over substance, of means over ends. And it's a very comfortable way of teaching general education because everybody can do whatever he or she likes, right? So do I wanna teach American history again? Give me a break. Right? But I may be on to a little wrinkle, you know, of Swedish parliamentary democracy. And uh, so I teach them that. After all, you know, they're going to learn what it is to work like a historian. And the uh, result has been the total watering down and uselessness of uh, general education. So, how are we doing here at the university? A little better than Harvard, but that doesn't mean anything. We're not doing well enough. We're doing better thanks to 
just outstanding efforts of some of the best of my colleagues in their attempt to uh, improve it. But we have far to go. And if the parental perspective does not persuade you that there is something, something really amiss, try the hermeneutics of embarrassment. What's that? Well, imagine that a friend of yours says, oh, I ran into one of your recent alums, and we got to talking, and it turns out he's never heard of the Louisiana Purchase. And I asked him about human rights, and he said, what's that? And uh, he thinks, you know, that uh, human beings originated 10,000 years ago. Wouldn't you be embarrassed and call for reforms? My fear is that we have unlearned to be embarrassed. So we have to summon up the courage to say to our students, this you must know. And it just seems obvious what they have to know. They have to know the basics of astrophysics, the basics of um, evolutionary theory, the basics of American history, the, uh, they, uh, they have to know human rights and the principles of democracy and the arguments that have been given in their support. And uh, that's just not happening. Speaking of courage, that's next. Philosophers have been anxious about the setting of courage since Aristotle. And the anxiety became acute early this century when William James was looking for the moral equivalent of war, because that used to be the school of courage, and it was disappearing. Most recently, conservative commentators and philosophers, in fact, such as Roger Scruton, and uh, the commentator uh, Theodore Del Rimple have made the liberal nanny state responsible for pulling the rug from under the possibility of courage by providing everything for people. Safety, security, health. That leads to moral obesity, says R Roger Scruton, and Theodore Dalrymple says, what's left for people to do? Shopping and sex. So what's the answer? Um, outlaw seat belts, you know, make things a little more dangerous so that when you get in your car, you're taking a risk. Do away with health care, what little we have. And, uh, you know, privatize retirement. Do away with social security. I think what these conservative theorists and commentators overlook, that there is one crucial challenge of courage that we regularly miss, and that is getting up from the couch and going out that door. To do what? Just to take a walk, or go on a run, or go to the theater. And, uh, this is where courage is needed. But as Aristotle points out, courage is not only threatened you know, by comfort and cowardice, it's also threatened by recklessness. So you want to construct an environment where being courageous through physical activity does not require recklessness, but where going out there and doing something is invited by the character of the physical environment that we've put together. And uh, as you know, River City is doing a fair job in um, making the environment um, inviting for running and biking and hiking and everything else, cross-country skiing. So we're doing fairly well there. But of course, there are these, these suburbs that, you know, where it's difficult to step out your door and, and go running. So here too, we could do more. 
Next is friendship. For Aristotle, friendship is the most important bond between two people. And uh, he thinks of it as that being the center and that it's radiating, radiating outward from there. Now, when you look at our culture and ask yourself, to what extent is it conducive to two people ca casting their lot together and giving that bond, the fidelity, the depth, and the endurance that gives it the kind of resonance that, you know, going from partner to partner just cannot give you. And the answer is that the culture is constructed in such a way that, for one thing, we're always distracted from being together by all kinds of prompts such as, you know, she's got her computer, I got my computer, she has her iPod, I have my iPod. Uh, she has that interest, I have another interest. So we're constantly pulled in uh, different directions. Moreover, and that's important, but uh, much under the surface, not unless it's there, there's always an alternative to the person that I'm with. I know it. And so if things get difficult, I say, hey, I don't need this, I'm out of here. And uh, as we all know, the cost of, I don't need this, I'm out of here, you know, if there are other people, is unfairly borne by women, much more by men. Nonetheless, it's an opportunity, uh, 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 something that's open for uh, women too. So it's, it's a fairly general feature of the culture. And, and, and you have to recognize that it is a pervasive feature. Everything that we have has alternatives. And with some things we're more impatient than with others. We're more impatient with music, right? So if we get tired of a song, we click on. We're a little less impatient with the furniture that we have. But still, you know, oh boy, it's getting boring and shabby, so there are prompts, you know, from uh, the furniture stores all the time, making it easy for me to replace them. Uh, we're less impatient with the houses, especially now. We're stuck with them for a while. And less impatient still with our spouses and partners and but nonetheless, there are always alternatives. So what's needed? Obviously, a world that's calmer, where face-to-face -face encounters and commitments are more easily made. And uh, where we have a culture where people recognize themselves face-to-face. -face. So all your friends on Facebook, are a mortal danger <laughs> to Aristotelian friendship. <laughs> and the point is never to outlaw a certain technology. The point is always to recognize what it's doing to us and then taking wakeful, determined, clear-eyed action. And in this case, to make openings where people do meet themselves, where we learn to look one another in the eye, to listen to one another, and to be uh, loyal friends and uh, faithful partners. Uh, finally, uh, there is grace. Grace is really what fills the public sphere with life. And there are two things that we have to provide. One is venues, and that is, you know, just spaces for concerts and gatherings and uh, exhibitions and so on. But we also, I think, have to support the content, that is, activities. And uh, the, the, the point is not to keep religion out of the public sphere, 
but to recognize religion, and I think that's the challenge for religious people, to accept it as a form of culture next to which there are other forms of culture, such as humanist forms of culture and, you know, deep ecology kinds of culture where people hold nature sacred rather than the Eucharist, as I do. Uh, and uh, without that support, I think concern for the sacred will not flourish. Okay, uh, that then uh, brings me to my uh, concluding remark, and that is that the pursuit of excellence needs the support of politics, and we can articulate the kind of politics that we need by phrasing it in terms of political virtues. One of them is old and recognized and championed by many, that's justice, fairness, a reasonable distribution of the goods that society has authority over. A second one that's increasingly coming into uh, currency and, and has its champions is stewardship, that is taking responsibility for the environment. And then a third one is needed, and that is that conscious attention to the way in which things such as taxation, transportation, land use, zoning, always has an impact on how we live together. And here too, I think, we're blessed with city council people that have a, a good grip on this, like my friend Jason Weiner and Dave Strohmeyer, I'm sure there are others. And uh, it's the virtue that I, I, I will call design. So these are needed to give wisdom or at least knowledge, friendship, courage, and, and grace about a chance to flourish. A chance to flourish. Because to change conditions in that way is not to force people to be courageous. It's to invite them. And as I said, on that we can't be neutral. We invite them either to consume more, to get in their cars, you know, and rush to uh, North Reserve, or we invite them to be with one another, to be physically active, to be devoted to the sacred. But the converse is true too. Justice, stewardship, and design need to be invigorated by those other virtues that we may call the personal or private virtues. Justice needs to be enlivened by friendship, by civic friendship, as it is sometimes called. Stewardship needs to be enlivened by grace. You have to remember that most environmentalists don't just want to make whatever we're doing now sustainable. They want a deeper kind of change, a more respectful and consoling relationship to the natural environment. And that'll be hard to come by if the rest of the world doesn't help us to appreciate the sacred and the arts and the letters. So, but if that's the case, then I think we can hope for a deepening of stewardship. And finally, design needs wisdom. And if wisdom is unavailable, general knowledge and education are close. What's the prospect of all this? Nobody controls or can predict culture. Profound historical changes are the great, unsurpassable, and unforthinkable contingency. But what we can do is recognize, first of all, that we are at a threshold, perhaps, of great change. And uh, my friend and colleague, Ron Perrin, 
We'll talk about this when he explains Obama a week from tomorrow in the Philosophy Forum, Tuesday, the 24th at 3.40 in the Gallagher Business Building. So knowing that there's at least a possibility of a threshold of renewal can encourage us to do here and now and in the station of our life to do what we know is the right thing to do. Thank you for your attention, and now I'll be glad to have your questions and comments. Thank you. If you have any questions or comments, please move to one of the microphones in the aisles, uh, introduce yourself, and then uh, we'll take it from there. Well, once more, I've made myself perfectly clear. <laughs> ah, thank you. OK. Um, my name is Tim Skufka. I was wondering if, if I may take the discussion to a local issue that's currently before Dave and uh, the rest of the CG yeah, Council. Right. Um, there's a, the issue of, uh, that they're struggling with currently of development and development that kind of exemplifies what you're saying about community versus capitalism, and that's um, development over our community resource of farmlands. And could you give City Council some guidance of how you would deal with that? Politics is the art of the possible. <laughs> <laughs> so often the problem is not knowing what to do, but how much of of that we can accomplish. And one thing that people don't recognize is private property. And by that I mean, when we first came here, there was just open country all, all over. And we ran in all kinds of places, Nancy and I and our friends, the bars, and we no longer can. And of course, so we're inclined to be angry, but that would be a mistake. That was open, but it belonged to somebody who had bought it. So if you want to run there, we've got to persuade our fellow citizens to buy it. And, uh, as, and, and I don't, again, I don't want to sort of undermine a good thing by setting the standard too high, right? If, if zoning can do it, city council can save something, then politics, the art of the possible, would say, don't kill it because you're saving it on the wrong grounds. Right? Save it if you can. But my point is that, and, and here again, this community has a mixed record, but it's not bad. Right? The bonds were uh, voted in, money is available for purchases, and then if you can get an agreement that the person whose fertile land is at issue can be held indemnified, you know, economically, then that, 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 that would be the best way to go. And uh, zoning, you know, is always a difficult issue because you know, the, it's not as though the properties that we have are sort of hermetically sealed from one another. One thing impinges on another. And so you have to have rules of what impingement is fine and what not, right? So um, I'm not sure I have shed a lot of light on this, but I think that's the best I can do. Thank you. So thank, thank you for your question.
I'm Joe Stevenson. Uh, Professor Borgman, I just have a question uh, regarding the, the virtues, uh, the, the personal virtues. Now, it seems that the change you call for is dependent on a kind of pointing out or, or convincing of people of the importance of the virtues, and you um, make reference to the, the, yeah. the child. Right. Uh, but if, if society or if culture is, is as eroded by technology or, or capitalism, even to the point of education being um, kind of forced into this, this kind of production capitalist ideal, uh, how, how can you claim that uh, these virtues are in some sense uncontroversial as something we would all want for our children rather than say we would someone would say, I want my child to be as, yeah. you know, a right. productive, strong capitalist, right. et cetera. Right. Um, so Joe's question is, you know, if there are these uncontroversial virtues, why doesn't everyone work for their realization, you know, in, in everyday life? And uh, one reason is that the alternative to the virtues, which is consumption, is attractive. And uh, it's attractive, I think, in large part for uh, evolutionary reasons, right? Take our desire for sweet things. Well, sweet things once were an important source of calories, and you would go for them. But of course, you couldn't sort of pick out on um, huckleberries, right? Uh, one reason is that they come in little portions, so it takes a while. And for another, in the Native American culture, they were needed for winter, for pemmican. And uh, so, but now, the problem is not that we don't have enough sweet stuff. The problem is we have too much. And, uh, but it remains attractive. Uh, everyone knows it, right? I mean, there is sort of a, an immediate and to some people, we have to recognize a profound pleasure in this. And, and so it is with entertainment and, and sex and all the rest. So to get out from under these, that Seductiveness is not easy, and it requires um, for the individual a sort of waking up to what's going on. And most people, I think, find themselves in this sort of semi-wakeful state where they know, you know, it should be different, but then the way they go about changing it is inept, right? They make these resolutions that never go anywhere. And uh, so let me add this to your uh, question. We're often, we often think that there are only two ways to, to react. Let me put it this way. There are only two ways in which the world acts upon us. It either forces us to do something or it leaves us free. And on that model, you know, of course you think, look, we're free. So why don't we just become virtuous? But we're not free. We find ourselves in circumstances that have the strong conducive power. And, uh, and I think those of us who have been given insights, have a responsibility to engender a discussion about this. Not because we're so smart, because we were lucky, right? It was either the talents we were born or the circumstances in which we grew up or the encounters that we had, you know, with a person like Henry Bugby that has enabled us to see. Does that help, Joe? That's good, thank you. Yep. Dan. I'm Dan Chemis, um, and Albert, I have a question about 
where, how you think it is that we most effectively move people to action and to change, and in particular, are we more likely to do it by emphasizing what's missing or what's present? When you talk about Missoula, I'm I'm a little surprised that, uh, that um, you seem to paint a picture that would lead us to believe that we were pretty good when we were just Hellgate Station, um, sort of a trading post, but it's sort of been all downhill from there. <laughs> uh, and in terms of the qualities that you so well evoke, it seems to me that's just not the case. That in terms of community, in terms of providing each other with opportunities for genuine human connection and connection with our surroundings, that we've done quite a bit better than just, as you characterize it, we're okay. Um, and it seems to me that if we're going to make a call for, as you do so well, for what we might aspire to at greater levels, whether national or global, that we might put more emphasis on what we've done well together here and use that to encourage ourselves and others to aspire even to greater things. Well, on one point, I quite agree with you, and that is that change will not come about if you scold people. And uh, what you have to do is disclose to, to them something that's better than what they're doing. As regards the conditions of you know, the first homesteaders, you can never take the past as a standard to emulate or even as a standard to judge. You can only take the past as a foil that brings certain features of the present to the fore. As regards, you know, human communication, uh, we must be careful not to be misled by privileged experiences that we may have in the small. Democracy is taking responsibility for everybody. So that's an empirical question. And uh, there's a, a book forthcoming by Felicia Song titled Bowling Alone But Being Together on the Internet, something like this. And uh, she She's a sociologist and she has examined internet communities and what effect they've had on democracy. And it's, it's a very careful and sophisticated and well-informed analysis. And, and the internet, of course, was greeted at first and is still advocated today as a way of making these new connections that put us together more intimately, regardless of local, of uh, uh, distance, regardless of gender differences, regardless of economic standing and all the rest. So she, and she looks in particular at, I think, five award-winning uh, internet communities. And the finding is that two things have increasingly transformed these communities, and they come in various types. One is they're being commercialized, one after another. And that is, they're taken over by some firm and used as a means to sell a lot of stuff. The second thing she calls, well, following some Another sociologist she calls personalism, which is not a good term, but the idea is 
that even under the best of circumstances where active and smart and skillful people do community work via the internet, they do, they do it as a form of self-fulfillment. And where that self-fulfillment ceases to be produced, they just leave. Uh, and so far from engendering democratic values, not to mention you know, personal friendships, it's just been taken over by the culture at large, subverted by the culture at large. And uh, so, yes, of course we should take pleasure in the things that are good. And, and, and this is a wonderful city. I think we can always all be pleased in them and we're indebted to Dan for having it pushed in a direction that, that's made it much better when he was mayor. But, um, you know, there's a thing that I call uh, the golden glow of Montana's smugness, of Missoula's smugness. <laughs> That's when we get, get sort of self-congratulatory about what a wonderful town this is. We're not wrong about this. But, you know, we're also responsible for Detroit and, uh, and, and for the ghettos and the inner cities. And we're responsible for those totally mentally absent teenagers that you never can talk to because, you know, they're always on their Blackberry or iPhone or whatever. And there, as I said, we have to look at responsible findings by social scientists and the news is not good. But to agree on the main, main point, you don't get that teenager, well, you've done something wrong if you have that teenager, but now that the teenager is doing this, you shouldn't just scold. You have to invite that person to something better. Although, depending you know, on what stage of teenage he or she is in, a little more <laughs> firmness may be required. But nonetheless, there has to be the promise that it's a wonderful bargain, you know, to put away the iPhone and sit down to dinner. Good evening, Professor Borgman. Uh, Grant Keir, and I, I believe you work with my wife, Bex, who sent me here tonight because she thought you would cheer me up. <laughs> <laughs> And I have to admit, you haven't. <laughs> so I was hoping that I could share with you the take-home message that I have so far in hopes of giving you another chance. Um, if, if I hear you correctly, it sounds like as a result of having a, a sort of an, an overabundance of um, good things in our lives here in the United States in our democracy, um, we have sort of become lazy amongst other things and disengaged with the world around us. Yeah. And I see in other parts of the world where I've traveled or where I've studied briefly that people are equally disengaged because they are disenfranchised or oppressed or just don't have access to education right. or information. Yeah. And it sounds to me like what you're suggesting is that like trying to listen to a, a radio station in Montana, getting things just right is really about just the perfect amount of fine tuning in a community, and I wonder in a growing world, uh, both in terms of population and perhaps in terms of philosophy and diversity, if is there really hope for getting that fine tuning? And if so, what is that hope? I think it requires more than fine tuning. It requires a change of the culture. And I think, you know, I, I said this this afternoon, so those who were there, forgive me. The, the culture that we have engenders an amazing degree of ignorance and indifference. And people are ignorant about what we do for those who, are suffer, who suffer from preventable diseases, starvation, have no shelter, are oppressed in various ways. And, you know, the indication is that in the survey, people were asked what they think the share of the federal budget that goes to foreign aid is, and they think it's 15%, and 
they are indignant and you ask them, well, what should it be? Well, they say 10%. It happens to be 0.7%. So what they think is fair and less than we do is 15 times uh, what we're actually doing. And, and so the, and it's not that these people are heartless, you know, that they've thought about it and said, you know, I need a big plasma screen and if, you know, millions of people die of starvation, well, tough. They just don't know. And so the, the challenge is to get them out of that indifference and ignorance. And those of us who think that we're not ignorant and indifferent, we have to take those among us who fail to have the insight that we pride ourselves off seriously. And uh, that's both an educational and a political task. But uh, when my students despair of the bad news that I bring, <laughs> I remind them of the consolations of philosophy. <laughs> And uh, what are the consolations of philosophy? There's one thing that's worse than seeing all the bad things, and that is being, is walking around in this fog and not really knowing what's going on, and not knowing how you're positioned towards what's going on in the world. So philosophy dispels the fog, and what you see is not always pretty. But the second part of the consolation of philosophy is that you know, as in Henry Bugby's world, words, will not betray you. What in terms of persons and rivers and art and traditions will serve you well. And we should be grateful about these things and not sort of belittle them given the bad news that's out there. So thank you very much for your attention this, this evening. <laughs>